Yes, for, for those of you who are millennials and younger, that scratchy sound was the scratching of a vinyl long playing <laughs> album on a, on a real phonograph. Mm -hmm. Will you come to prayer with me this morning? Wonderful and loving God, as we come to you this day, as we honor those saints who have gone before us and those that are still yet to come into that realm. Be with us now as we hear your word and hear the things that we need to hear and learn this day. Let us continue to have our gratitude in our lives for those that are a part of our lives and let us praise and honor you this morning by keeping our vision growing and keeping those things in our midst alive and well. So I ask now that you will touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations that come from each of our hearts. May they ever be acceptable to you in the name of Jesus the Christ in whom we pray, amen. So many of us cope with problems in our lives, some on a more frequent basis, some not on a frequent basis, but I can probably bet that all of us are dealing with some type of problem or crisis in our lives at the current moment. But I think that somewhat it unites us as people because I think we all have problems that come along with things and that we're probably going to encounter someone who doesn't have problems or issues that are going on in their life, just like the rest of us. And I'm not sure that I don't have to convince any of you in our current day that we probably can identify and list the problems that our culture is facing. We've all been experiencing the pandemic. We've been introduced to these things called canceled culture, along with racial tension, as well as political tensions that we've all faced over these last how many years. But I think the biggest question in our lives is that we want to know who's in charge. Who is actually in charge of everything? And so there is the truth that threads its way through the pages of scriptures as well as through the pages of history. And well, they've always been around. And it threads its way through the problems in life and it holds this entire cosmic experience together. And this truth has lasted for thousands and thousands of years since literally of the beginning of time. It's old, but yet it's relevant. It's ancient, but yet it's current. It's vintage, if you'll let me say that. And what is vintage and what does vintage mean? besides that we're all probably getting into that category of being vintage. Vintage means of old, recognized, and enduring interest of importance of quality. It's something that's been around for a while, but its value never has gone away, and it's still valuable today. So let's go to one of the greatest good old field Old Testament books that are. There are two out there that are named after women. 
One we heard of this morning was Ruth, and of course the other is Esther. And the scripture lesson this morning is set in the period of Judges in which it's before Israel had a king. This was a time where there was mortal decay in culture. People were losing their way and all kinds of great stories in scripture that come out of this period of Judges. And the people, even the godly people, were facing countless problems at the same time. Asking that same question that we're asking ourselves this morning, who's in charge in this moment? So the very first problem that is encountered was we heard right off the bat in our Hebrew lesson this morning in Ruth that long ago when judges governed Israel, a famine swept over the land. There's a national crisis taking place here. There's no vaccine. There was no vaccine, and i probably safe to say because there wasn't anything getting in the way. The left wing wasn't getting along with the right wing and vice versa. And I mean, things were altered, people were afraid, and we just heard that nobody had any food because of a famine. We also heard a family from the town of Bethlehem in Judah, and a woman and a man who had two children they immigrated to the region of Moab. And I always love when we, when we get to hear the scripture readings and all that, when everyone can't read the names of the words because they're such ancient words. But the man's name was Emelech, which means God is my ruler, and the woman's name was Naomi. And they had their two sons who were Ma excuse me, Maon and Heon. They were seeing that this was taking them and they were leaving Bethlehem. Which now then poses another problem is that the family is trying to escape from this famine to a land called Moab. And it's somewhat important to understand because they're all moving away from Hebrews and the Jewish people away moving to Moab and they were lucky that it was in a current place between Israel and Moab because there's not always been the two. Now through all of this, Emelech dies and Naomi is left with her two sons. And that's almost the sense of giving them hope. Because in this culture of having the male around or a male member of the family around was a necessity. It was just the way the culture was. It wasn't like we are today. When we heard in our Hebrew lesson that two sons eventually married two Moabite women, and their names were Orpha and Ruth, they had lived in a land of Moab for about 10 years, at which both times, both of them died. So that now poses that next problem for all the women are now widows. There's not a man to be seen. There's no safety. There's no security. There's no so ways to survive that these ladies and when all that they sat down at the dining room table to discuss their options, it became a bit scary. Things went to places that they had never been before. Now, we have to know that Naomi accepts her fate and pretty much sends her two daughter-in-laws out to seek another husband for each of them so they can be taken care of while they are still young. So pretty much it sums it up as we heard that in the, this morning's lesson that may the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. And as she was saying this, it was not for fulfillment. It wasn't for lifelong love, but they did it in the sense of need or necessity. They had to have a man take care of them according to the way culture was. Not like today where we have that freedom where sometimes the woman is the dominant to take care of us. And if we had read further into the chapter this morning, which we didn't, but we would have heard again that they wept and that Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Now another problem then becomes apparent that Orpha decides to leave 
one of the daughter-in-laws. And so instead of three women, there are now two trying to survive in a world not friendly to unattached women. I don't know about you, but sometimes my gator goes on because we know that Ruth and Naomi in the books or whatever, as we saying of the, the non-traditional relationships, but I'll leave that to your imagination this morning. But Ruth and Naomi did not only have the insecurity, but they knew what they had to do. They knew that they had to return to their homeland. So when they arrived back in their homeland, which was Bethlehem, and when they arrived, Naomi announces that she don't call her Naomi anymore, but call me Mara instead. It says, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me and went away full, but the Lord brought her back home completely empty. And if you translate the word Mara, it means bitter. So then that question reappears again, who's in charge? And before we somewhat leave this portion of that scripture and leaving that story of Ruth, because all of these characters were facing significant life-altering problems. But now our problems may not be the same as Ruth in this current day, and I bet if any of us could write our own problems, we could write a chapter or two. If we just took that moment to sit there, here are all the problems in my life. I bet we'd fill the pages. Now, we have to keep in mind it's a seven day trip to Bethlehem from Moab for both Naomi and Ruth. And knowing that they were women of faith, we knew that, they were, that Naomi was raised in the Jewish culture and she had those rich Jewish roots and traditions and you think that she would start utilizing them, and she did. She prayed as they did in that day. But there still was that loss of destination, that loss of uncertainty, and even that insecurity. You know, it's like when you have that trip from the doctor's office as you're driving home with all of that grief and problems in your head. It could be problems that you have at work that day as you're driving home. But we know that she was praying because that's the way she kept her faith. They all me also knew, excuse me, the law of God and that God had put in place for the people things specifically. And Naomi knew that if the field was harvested, that the outside edges of the field were to be left standing to help the people who were in need in their community. And that was one thing that God said in the law that as Naomi was moving back to Bethlehem, she was counting on all of this for survival. And she and Ruth then made their way home. Now, upon their arrival at Bethlehem, Ruth goes out to the fields of Boaz and Boaz was a distant relative of Naomi, and as she began to glean what she could for her and Naomi, that Ruth started to follow the workers, picked up whatever she could so she could survive. Now Boaz, owning these fields, notices Ruth, and for the first time in this short story, something now happens. And now we get to what we heard in the second part in our scripture lesson that comes out with Boaz saying to, listen to my words. Listen, my child, and accept my offer. Don't collect your grain in anyone else's field but mine. And don't leave here. Stay here with my binders, he says. Watch them closely, and whatever part of the field they are harvesting, follow behind them. And that I order all of my reapers not to bother you when you get thirsty, but to let you go to those water jars and to get that drink of water. Maybe now is the time to share that vintage moment. We remember what our definition of vintage means, right? It means of old, recognized, enduring, interesting, important, and quality. 
So here's the vintage truth that runs through the pages of Scripture, and that is God loves people all the time. The possibility of one of the greatest things that we might wrestle with is that people sometimes wrestle with that God loves people. Every person who is placed on this planet is designed to deeply be loved daily by God and the followers of God. We know that God sent Jesus to show us how to live and how to love. And it's very difficult in a world, but God gave us Jesus to have that sacrifice for that forgiveness of our sins. I mean, I don't think God would have done it for just any old reason. But God gave us the Holy Spirit that we might be comforted and be guided. And when this world sort of bites us where it doesn't be, and through all those difficult times, that we don't just pick up the phone and say, okay, I'm going to call the pastor and ask for Lord's blessings, but we know that God is with us through all of that. I think one of the greatest expressions that God has for us is things are still ahead. So if God loves me, wouldn't it be fair to say that all of our prayers are heard? So to the point of cruciality and the hinge of the story of the moment that everything changes in this book of Ruth, it's almost that you can chart it step by step. And as you come to each point through the story, if you read through the entire story of Ruth, that things start progressively moving up. Ruth goes home and tells Naomi of the kindness of Boaz. And if you continue to read in Ruth, you'd hear, may the Lord bless him. He is showing his kindness to us. That man of one of four of the closest relatives, one of our family redeemers. If you ever take time to study Ruth, redemption is the key part and the most important part of this whole vintage truth of God loving people. We see this in the book of Ruth when it actually comes to a close. We hear God, hear me, God help me. And Boaz becomes this redeemer in scripture, breaking things that are being made whole. Throughout the entire story, and Mara, who again I said means bitter, for the first time now has hope because she asked God to hear her and asking God for the help and her prayers are answered. God hear me, God help me. There's an important piece of this vintage truth of God loves people that we see in the book of Ruth as it comes to a conclusion. Obviously that things didn't turn out the way Ruth and Naomi wanted them to turn out. All because life doesn't do that. We can't chart our course the way we want it to have it to work out. I mean, nobody can plan, plan for the pandemics or plan for those diversions that come in our life. We've all experienced this at one point or another, and we know that it can be difficult. And we know that life doesn't turn out the way we want it to go. Did you know that puzzles have made a comeback into the world? That over the last three years, especially during the pandemic, people have reverted back to doing puzzles. You know, that box with all those little pieces in there. You know, it's just kind of like all scattered and you have to try to put the picture together. There are those so many intricate pieces to that puzzle. But just for a moment, imagine if we were doing this thousand piece puzzle all together dealing with all of those intricate pieces. And as we sat down doing this puzzle and we'd have it all laid out on the table, I'm sure we probably would have the box at some point vis visible to see what this puzzle is supposed to look like, using it as a point of reference, knowing how to put the puzzle together. But what if we turned the box over and just saw the back end, which is all blank? We wouldn't know what pieces go together. We'd probably be not sure if 
we knew what was going on or what it would look like. We maybe think that we don't know what's going to evolve next. And we find ourselves wrestling just like we wrestle with things in our life. But in the long run that we've all tasted that, we've all tried to figure out where all those pieces go in our life and maybe it's a good thing. Because I think if we knew or we had an idea of the things that we were facing in life, we could probably bank that we might take a different path moving forward. And while one of us actually has the entire picture, we do have this vintage truth that never fades. It never retires. It never stops being relevant that God loves people. Now, as you continue through all of this, Boaz marries Ruth. And it's a wonderful story with all the feel goods and the fuzzy warm feelings. And you could probably capture that through and make a Hallmark movie out of that. But if you go all the way through the book of Ruth, all the way to the far end in chapter 4, I want you to hear the conclusion. It says, so Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. And the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman of the town said to Naomi, excuse me, praise the Lord who have now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be the famous one in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him into her breast as she cared for him as it was her own. And they named him Obed. There's all these names again. But he became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. Now, if you pay attention to the names that we hear throughout the readings and throughout scripture, we see a lot of similarities and differences. And believe it or not, that same set of names and texts, whatever, reappear in the New Testament at the very beginning of Matthew. As Matthew starts introducing all of the characters once again. And as the book plays through, it says, Boaz was the father of Obed, who was the mother, was Ruth, and Obed as the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. It was all playing out for something good as you start connecting the dots, starting to put the puzzle pieces together. But was it easy? Of course not. Was it filled with problems throughout time? You bet your bottom dollar there was. But the great takeaway from all this is that we get to live on the side of revelation that God is always working on our side in the bigger picture. And we have to keep in mind that we have no idea how God will use our responses to our problems or our responses to the trials and the bitterness that could be forming inside of us, we have no idea how God will be doing what God does so amazing in our life. But that's what God does. God took this nobody that knew nobody, and that was Ruth and Naomi and Elimelech, and they produced this tapestry and one day that it would provide our Lord and Savior to be a part of the community and a part of the world. And here all Naomi thought that she was doing was gleaning the wheat to survive to the next day. And of course, we know that's not what was going on, and I think it's safe to say that we had no idea of what God was doing and through all of our lives, even right now. Because if we did, I think we'd probably be paying a lot more attention. So we need to remember that the vintage truth is this. God loves people. And you have no idea what a beautiful picture God is putting together in your life or in mine, even now, even on our best day, even on our not best day. God loves people. Blessings upon each and every one of you this morning. Amen.